also got a guidebook I'll we'll be referring to later. Various things that they found there, medieval pipes, silver objects, posy rings. Let's get another look. A bit dark in here, but that would be all right. Bronze objects from the Verlaminian Ver Ver region, and that's what it was called. Verlaminian, Verlamio, settlement above the marsh. That's where it gets its Verlamium from. You're standing in the middle of Verlamium. In Roman mm -hmm. times, this was the third largest town in Britain. But for at least 100 years before the Roman conquest in 1843, this area was the heartland of one of the most powerful of the British tribes, mm -hmm. the Catalogoni. Today, some of the earthworks that defined their tribal capital can still be seen. The mm -hmm. About making coins? Are at Wheat Hampstead, to the north of Berenina. Yeah. With a prosperous economy based on farming, the Catalani were able to obtain fine Roman goods to use alongside their own. In the decades before the conquest, they traded wheat and slaves for wine, olive oil, fine metalwork, and pottery. The tribe did not resist Roman rule after 1843 and may have welcomed it. Very soon, Verulamium began 400 years of development as a planned Roman town, beginning with a ditched enclosure, a regular pattern of streets, and straight roads linking the town to others in Britain. The new town had a privileged status and may have been self-governing. Its inhabitants enjoyed the advantages of a more sophisticated Roman way of life. Other tribes were not so easily won over. In AD 60 or 61, Boudicca, queen of the Iceni of East Anglia, marched against the invaders. Mm. She destroyed the Roman towns of Colchester, London, and Verulamium before her forces were eventually defeated. Now, talk about the Roman conquest here, yeah? AD 43. It took 20 years for Verulamium to recover. During this time, scraps of body armor found from a legionnaire. And fittings for the horse. And Boudicca's revolt. Mm, quite a lot here. Oh wow. Finger rings, fragments of jet bracelets, gold finger rings with common called garnet, garnet, AD 5200. Look at that. Some poor and hoof impressions found on clay tiles, prints from dogs, cats, goats, sheep, cattle, and wild deer. Look at that. <laughs> Good grief. You must have stepped on the wet clay as the tiles were driving, drying in the sun. Animal skulls. Some of the food they may have had. And mushrooms. Hmm. 
tools working the land. Turf cutters, plowshares, spades. Mm. And it's from Gorham Berry Villa. Some of the uh, wall plaster. Gorhambury Villa, place in the country. And they had a bathhouse there. <laughs> Centres of farming, the mosaic. Uh, the villas at Gorhambury were built over close to pre Roman farmsteads. Auditorium. My actual bones were in very good condition. It was my bones that really gave the archaeologists. Oh, look at that. Newborn babies. They knew I was male from the shape of my bones, in particular the larger brow on the skull and the narrowness of the bones at the rope. And the lack of wear. Found some rich burial near Wheat Hempstead. But they changed their mind when they saw my thyroid. Which had ossified. The older the person, the more this cartilage becomes burnt. As you can see, mine is pretty solid. Fish and lobster. These ragged marks on my vertebrae show that I suffered a little from my right. Grave goods. But it was nothing. This is a child's coffin. Remains. You would have thought there was much more than this, but you know what archaeologists think. Construction of a fireplace. <laughs> Knives and spoons. And some woodworking tools. The plane you might recognise from today. Chisels, hammers, a saw, axe. There's a carpenter's workshop. <laughs> There's wall paint in here, so it's a very lamium has some of the best preserved wall paintings from Roman Britain, the work of specialist artists. Tools are simple and familiar today. Trestles, floats and trowels were laying the lime plaster and brushes. Artists ground his own colours, mix them with glue, egg or honey. The large iron float was used to lay mortar floors. These are the wall paintings of Verilamium. It was one of the first Roman sites where plaster was recovered in large sections. The excavators found the plaster had often sheared off the wall and fallen face down onto the ground, probably due to water damage. And wall plaster found collapse could be lifted by applying plaster or resin over the coat in the back of it and allowing it to dry. So that's how they managed to keep it. Look at that. Wow. About handicrafts, spinning and needlework. Well, wow. wall paintings at Verilanium. Those walls were painted plain white, but wealthy individuals would decorate their homes with bright colours. Decorated rooms featured upper and lower panels with a dividing dado roll, row, rail. working from home. I think we invented that. He's writing instructions on a wax tablet to, for his steward to take to London. 
His wealth is based on land and commerce and he was dealing with the export of hides to Gaul and import of wine to Valanium. <laughs> Look at this, that is beautiful. More mosaic. This is a Sandridge hoard, 159 gold coins known as Solidae. Solide, Solide. Found 10 miles from Vera Lane, close to a Roman road, is the largest surviving hoard found in this country. Consists of nothing but Solidae. Wow. So, they look almost brand new. Incredible. Yep. A different um, single, single currency across the empire. Allowed the emperor to portray himself in a positive light. about the coins and things. Mints and marks. So Roman imperial coins were legal tender across the empire from Hadrian's Wall to the Middle East. Britain is a large island with a rich and varied natural resources. Specialised luxuries and necessities were carried many days journey from their place of origin. The Roman Empire is famous for its roads but tra transport was slow and painful. Journeys could be made by foot, by pack animal, donkey, mule or horse, by wagon, carriage or water. Main goods and news all travelled at the same speed. I'm talking about baths in here. So baths were introduced into, the, into Britain by the Romans. A public bathhouse was an important recreational and social centre and a place of business full of talk and gossip and news of the wider world. Rolamium had a bathhouse in what is now St Michael's village. Shows how important bathing was to the Romans and how eagerly native people adopted Roman habits. The tem theatre temple, which we saw earlier. Some of the things that were found when it was first built it had a high wall surrounded it, it created a sense of mystery. And the triangular temple dedicated to Sibylle, eastern goddess of human progress and cities, and her husband Attis, popular cult in the Roman Empire from 200 onwards. Here are some of the masks from the theatre. A bit of dining and music. So board games were popular with people in Verulamium, and many of them involved gambling. Boards looked rather like chess boards were made of bone and counters of bone and glass, pottery and horn. Said life was hard, made bearable by sports, games, and festivals. They're beautiful trees blossom. It's the park. I think if we walk along that edge over there, we'll get to the wall first. Yep, okay. Found some steps there. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go up the steps, haven't you, pups? 
Yeah, the mosaics in there, isn't it? Well, there's nothing on that sign. Oh, right, okay. But yeah, it's a nice view of the abbey from here. takes your breath away doesn't it? It says this uh, is built over the surviving foundations part of a Roman townhouse excavated in 1931. The floor forms just one room of a great house which is 200 feet long with 300 rooms on two stories dated to AD 180. Modified 100 years later one of many large masonry houses built in Verulamium around this time after a catastrophic fire destroyed many of its earlier wooden buildings. The central block had two storeys and contained the entrance and smaller rooms. A colonnaded veranda looked onto the courtyard or garden at the front of the house and faced southeast to catch the sun. The uphill wing and which is down with single storey contained magnificently decorated rooms with high ceilings. Downhill wing may have just been maybe a, the downhill wing may have been just as splendid but the excavators found that floors and walls have been ploughed away or robbed. The excavators removed a fine mosaic of a horned sea god from an adjoining room which is in the museum. Several rooms in this wing were supplied with underfloor heating or a hypercost including this one. It's possible that together these form part of a private bath suite but more likely simply provide a warmth to the rooms. I can't really see it, but that is the stoke hole for the furnace. Mm. Amazing. Mm. So this is one of the gate houses, isn't it? That's the one, I think it's the one I drew the picture of. Okay. Yeah, so that's an artist's impression of the uh, London Gate. So it had four gates at the points where the major roads reached the town. The imposing London Gate set a, sat aside Watling Street on its route, route from Dover to Chester via London. Other gates span roads which link the town to Colchester and Silchester, making it very well connected with the rest of the country. He said, while the gates and wall would have provided security, the town seems to have lacked the military forces who have been needed to man it. More likely built as an expression of civic pride and to control the flow of goods and people into the town. The footprint in front of you clearly shows the four routes of passage through the London Gate. Animals would have gone, would have been, the middle ones would have been for animals and the two outer ones for the pedestrians. Yeah, so there are two wider ones there and the smaller ones over there. And you can still see the foundations of it. And it's such a shame that all the stone's gone. Oh no. Probably went in that big building up there. It could possibly have done, yeah. It was really impressive, wasn't it? Yeah. But it's still here. Yeah. And this bit of wall here is quite impressive. Still quite a lot of wall here. And said the town walls were built in the late third century and were almost two miles long and seven feet thick. They were built of flint and lime mortar, of course, as a brick tiles running through them. The earth bank behind the wall may represent part of an earlier defence to which the walls were added in the third century. This section of wall has probably survived because it was in a wooded area, making removal of materials difficult. Right. Uh, Verulamium yeah. was surrounded on three sides by ditches like the ones behind us. That's what we're seeing, yeah. Over there. Originally these would have been over 20 metres wide and 8 metres deep. Wow. The River Ver provided extra protection on the fourth side and they predate the Roman town and may have been part of the defences of the previous Iron Age settlement, Verulamium. Vera, ver, ver laminium. <laughs> and look out for the remains of the wall. You can see the courses of red brick tiles running between the layers. Close by, there was once a tower projecting from the wall. Here. Here, I think. I think. Yeah. 
uh, although a little of it is visible today, the remains of a better preserved town may be seen if you follow your, the path to your left. You know, have a quick look up there then? Yeah. Look at the size of these oaks here. Yeah. Is that an oak? It's not an oak, is it? Beach. Come on. Or something, I don't know. Oh, it's chestnut, I think. Oh, is it? Okay. There is there, yeah. Thanks for that. We well, can see how deep the ditch was. The Vera Minium. At the time of the conquest, Britain, there was a thriving Iron Age town here called a Vera Limium. Oh, good grief. <laughs> you want to try and say it? No, no, you're doing brilliantly. Established by a major British tribe, the Catuvalani. In AD 61, Queen Boudicca of the Iceni tribe led a great rebellion against the Romans, destroyed Colchester and London before reaching Verla Minium, which was razed to the ground. The Roman historian Cassius Dio wrote of Boudicca, in stature she was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. Following the defeat of the uprising at the Battle of Watling Street, the new town of Verlamium arose from the ashes of the former. The settlement covered a much larger area than later Roman town and was surrounded by banks and ditches separating areas for industry, animals and agriculture. The Catuvalani appear to have been relatively accepting of the conquering Romans who may have, been, who may have made the tribal chieftain a client king in return. It says, look out for the corner tower in front of you. It gives an indication of how impressive later Roman wars must have been. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that is the corner, isn't it, as well? Yeah, so obviously the gates were there, so it must have come down here and around and across here. And bits of the wall here. Yeah, so I suppose this bit of high bank is part of the wall, isn't it? Yeah, I can see yeah. stones under there. Yeah. It's an old map. Uh. Yeah, it's a really old map, isn't it? In the early 5th century, the Roman legions were withdrawn from Britain as barbarian settlements within the border of the Roman Empire increased. The largest markets for the economy of Roman Britain were lost and change was inevitable. Anglo-Saxons and other tribes began to arrive in Britain and Verulamium seems to have continued as a smaller Romano-British enclave, it d eventually developing into a royal centre for Saxons called Kingsbury. And, it's, yeah. and it says by the 10th century, mason, f masonry from the town's buildings or wards were being robbed to provide materials for uh, the abbey and other church buildings. If you look at the abbey's 11th century tower, you can see it's almost entirely built of Roman materials. And this town wall survived because it formed part of the enclosure of St Germain's chapel built in the 12th century AD. Right, so that's why that's still here. And it says on the historic map above, the red line shows the boundary of Verulamium, Ver Verulamium Park. And you can find some of the landmarks that still survive today, such as the Cathedral, Abbey Gateway, St Michael's Church and the River Ver. It says, watch out for herons, home for generations. So the island over there is a heronry. Yeah. A place where a large number of herons gather together and raise their young over many generations. So yeah, they must have had a fair bit of rain here because the banks are muddy here. Some of it's been to, like, washed away here. Yeah. Come on, I don't Come want on, you in the mud. Come on, don't want you in there. <laughs> People ask why we keep popping a lead. <laughs> You're not going, You're not in, going there. in the mud. No. Come on. This is the River Ver. It's a chalk river. It's a very special type of river. There's only 200 in the world. Fed for an underground chalk aquifer. A layer of porous water that holds, walk, holds water like a sponge. It says chalk rivers are globally important for the rare species of life, wildlife they support, often fast flowing and clear with gravel bottoms, variety of plant life. In Hertfordshire, chalk rivers such as the River Ver were an important part of the uh, watercress industry, which flourished in the 19th and early 20th century. 
That's right, it was a village we used to go to, didn't we? Which had yeah. a lot of water crests there. Yeah, so in the middle of the 20th century there was a large groundwater pumping station in the Ver water. This has been turned into flats, but I think that was an old mill. Oh, was it? And I found some of my uh, ancestors living and working in there. What, your famous ancestors? No, they weren't that famous, because I can't okay. remember their names. <laughs> Only famous if I can remember their names. OK. Now, here's a famous place. It's lovely to see. It looks like it's open. Yeah. It was closed for a while, wasn't it? We all thought it was going to close forever. Yeah. The old fighting cocks. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly held Oliver Cromwell for one night during the Civil War, stabling his horse in what's now thought to be the bar area. Underground tunnels of the inn provided useful bolt holes in troubled times. Should we have a bolt? <laughs> so it's saying this is the old roundhouse it was rebuilt built in, after the flood of 1599. It was originally a medieval pigeon house in 1400, erected as a house in 1600 on the site of St Germain's Gate, part of the local monastery, founded by King Offa. It became the local centre of a cockfight in the 17th and 18th century, renamed the Fisherman, when sport became illegal in 1749 reputedly the oldest public house in Britain. Mm. Say so they're dog friendly, so we're going. Have a look. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The dining area. Where we normally went. You wanna go in there? Uh, yeah. Well, this is the cockpit area of the fighting cocks. We often used to come down here, didn't we? Yeah, we used to meet in a fairly big group over there, I think. Yeah. And you'd play on the piano, wouldn't you? I would, yes, yeah. <laughs> so I'm really good at that. Yeah. I don't remember the piano. No. <laughs> I red curry, I think it is, isn't it? And fish and, fish and chips. chips. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and a hungry dog. And a hungry dog. It was very nice. We've come out to find it raining. raining. Well, it's spitting a little spitting, bit. Spitting, yeah. Yeah. No coats. I haven't got any coats. So I think we're going to get a trifle wet. Yes. No, we're not. It's not actually that bad. But yeah, I'm really pleased to go back in there. Yeah, this really brings back mirrors. We used to come down here when we were school holidays. My friend Susan. Yeah. So practically every afternoon, we'd walk down from the, you know, where we lived. Yeah. And walk all the way around here, over the bridge, back round there, and then back home. Yeah. And we used to walk to the fighting cocks, didn't we? Yeah. And back. From our little flat in London, uh, old London Road. Yeah, and from Woodland Drive originally. Yeah, so uh, we really enjoyed ourselves today. I hope you did. And uh, if you're in the area, definitely come and visit St Albans. It's absolutely gorgeous, really. There's so much to see. And we haven't touched the town, of course. No, no. No. To come back and do that. Yeah. So if you did enjoy the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And we'll catch up with you in the next video. Yeah. All right, so we'll see you then. Yeah, bye, bye then. Bye then. There's the uh, old boating pond. Yeah, I used to sell my yacht on there. Sell your yacht. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, mast always used to collapse. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a bit of history on the lake. It said even in Saxon times there was a large deep fish pond here, but following the creation of Verulamium Park, Ver Park, 1929 for the use of people of St Albans, the lake was built as an ornamental feature, provide much needed employment and depression. In the depression of the 30s, many navvies travelled down from the north looking for work, and the government helped subsidise this project uh, helped employment for many people. The lake is located in the lowest point of the valley, 
which is the natural course of the River Ver. Prior to construction, there was a Roman cemetery was discovered in this area and suggests that the course of the river was altered during the Roman occupation of Verulamium. It looks like, um, you know, we were over by St. Germain's, yeah. bit of wall. Looks like it was a farm. It was a farm there, yeah. Before it became the park. And that's it in the late 19th century. Yeah, because there's an old barn over there, you know, near, near the museum. Yeah. That so you think that might have been something to do with the farm there? Yeah. Okay. Come on then. 